Well, family, I'm really excited because I'm going to be concluding our two-part series this morning on honor that Teacher Paul started on Sunday night, and it was such a blessing, wasn't it? And one of the things he said was this. He says, we are living in a culture of criticize, condemn, and cancel. (laughs) And that kind of, I thought, wow, that is just, you know, there's just so much craziness going on in the world. Would you agree with that? And you know, as much as I respect governments and I respect laws, I mean, how many of you know that written laws can't change our hearts, right? Only God can do that, amen? And that's the reason, family, I believe that it's actually time that the church should rise up if we want to see a difference in the world around us. And sometimes we just look to other places, other sources for that to happen. But you see, it has to happen in our hearts. And as it does, we project that on society around us. And that's the reason that we just continually teach on all these values that as God changes us, we can then make a difference in our world. Amen, family? You know what? God is so good, and I believe that it's going to happen because we serve an all-powerful, almighty God, and I believe in this amazing church filled with the Spirit of God that we are going to go out there and make a difference in our world. And so our, our theme verse for, the, for this series is found in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. And it says this, honor one another above yourselves. And if I say it quickly, it sounds wonderful. But gee, think about that. I've been meditating on this verse. Honor one another above yourselves. And human nature kind of says, hang on, me first. That's how we kind of live, right? And the Bible tells us something quite different from that. And let's have a look once again to what this word honor actually means. It means to value, to respect, to highly esteem, to treat as precious, weighty, and valuable. That, that's a big deal. That just, just to the people that you really think are worthy of honor. <laughs> no, 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 no. That person that backs a political party completely opposite to what you back, that nasty next door neighbor of yours, and yes, even your ex, right? We hold them up in value. And so today, I want to give you really covered two areas. Firstly, who it is then that we honor, and then secondly, how do we do that? You want to know about that? So I've got 10 points. We've got quite a marathon this morning. Seven of them are on the who's, and three of them are on the how's. You ready for this? So number one, who do we honor? Pretty broad, broad we honor others, right? We just read it. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. It says, honor, say it with me, everyone. Right? <laughs> So even if you don't agree with them, and even if you really don't like them very much, family, we are going to hold them up in honor, right? We're going to put weight and value and worth and respect on that person, irrespective of how we feel about them. Honor everyone, the Bible says. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And here's what's interesting about this verse Teacher Paul mentioned it, that at the time that Peter wrote this verse, Nero was the emperor. He wasn't a nice guy. He was a Christian killer. I mean, he would kill Christians, not not because they did anything wrong, just for the fun of it, just to see their their blood flowing. So this is the kind of lifestyle God is saying, we're going to honor them anyway. 1 Peter 2 verse 17 in the message translation says it like this. It says, treat everyone that you meet with dignity. And I believe that's how God intends for us to act. And I believe that as we act this way, that God is going to do something in the world around us. He's going to make a difference simply by the way that we act. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And I want to Let's push pause for a moment and say, this is most probably the most selfish, self-centered, narcissistic society that ever existed. And the Bible says right there, you know, you're not even going to put a filter on vain conceit. 
But in, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, listen to this, consider others better than yourselves. So nothing out of selfish ambition. It carries on. It says, each of you should not look only at your own interests, but also the interests of others. Now, we as a church, we, we've embraced this value to the point where we've said, you know, once a year, we're going to put aside all of our own things and all of our own stuff, and we are going to serve our community. And I was so, so blessed. In fact, on our serve day, I was on Teacher Lane and Teacher, Teacher Paul's team. And you know, family, when you, <laughs> it amazes me, you get these guys looking over their balcony on how you're cleaning up the mess outside of their apartment building. That's what it's all about, to serve others. But what impressed me even more is the cars that were coming by would stop, and the people would come and say, Who, where are you from? Can we be a part of this too? How do we be a part of this team? And then T.G. Lane brought little Hannah with as well. And you know, family, that's such an important thing that we pass these values on to our children. I mean, she had a ball, not only being as cute as anything, she was there and she was loving just serving other people. And that's how we do it in our homes. So number two, we honor authority. So let me just say that, you know, God has actually given us four authorities in, 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 in our lives. I mean, can you believe it? A lot of people have a little bit of an issue with different authorities. And the first one and the most important one is our government authority. So let's have a look at all of them. Let's have a look at government authority. The Bible tells us in Romans 3 and verse 1, it says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Right, the authorities that have exist have been established by God. Now, let me just say this right away. It doesn't mean that God agrees with them. But it is, it, it is exactly the area and, and the foundations that he works through them. And so, you know, last week, Apostle Theo spoke to us abundantly on Daniel, and I'm so grateful for that, because he was a perfect example of this family. Is that, you know, he was, he was living... In this, he was a captive in an enemy nation, and he was serving under this wicked king, Nebuchadnezzar. But he knew, Daniel knew not to defy him, but to serve him. And because he did that, he was a great influencer in this whole nation of Babylon. And I believe that that is what God has called us to do. It carries on and it says, consequently, whoever rebels against authority, is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. You see, so I'm saying once again, it doesn't matter if we agree with them or not. It doesn't matter. In actual fact, if you look at Daniel's life, it doesn't even mean that we need to obey them. If they ask us to do anything, it goes against the word of God. But we are to hold them up in honor. Amen, family? So here's, for me, what really, really works. You know, you may say, wow, you know, how, how do I live this out? And I'm saying, in First Timothy, we, we read how we should be praying for those that are in authority. And that is a great way to honor the government officials, that we actually pray for them every single day, all of the government authorities. And let me say this as well, is that, you know, there may be a person that is in office that you sincerely, intensely dislike, but it actually doesn't give anybody the authority to speak badly of them. And, you know, there are churches that I've heard that actually even curse political parties because of what they stand for. And listen, I understand the sentiment, but the Bible does not give us the right to speak negatively over anybody. Amen, family? It's just not scriptural. As I said, it doesn't matter whether we agree with them or not, whether we dislike them, whether we like them. We do not speak curses over them because we want the best for our nation. We want to live a happy, peaceful, godly, successful life. So that's what we pray. We pray for our government. We pray for our leaders, those in authority, our president, that they would have a God encounter, that they would lead us according to godly principles, that they would lead this country into peace and prosperity, and, and that there, there would be just this 
what God intended for us, that we can live our lives out in godliness, family. And that's important that we do that. And even for our police officers, our police force, that we have honorable and honest police force and military, and in fact, anybody that actually puts their lives in danger in order that we may live in peace. Amen. So we just keep them up in prayer. The second authority that God has put in our lives is where we spend our daytime hours. So that would be our workplace or for the younger people, maybe school and and, and varsity. And once again, young people, I'm saying pray. Pray for your teachers. Pray for your headmasters. Pray for your lecturers. And maybe you don't like them and maybe they're just not fair. Maybe you just don't really agree with what they're saying. But I want to tell you when we pray for them, it's going to benefit us greatly. And for those of us who are working, let's pray for our boss. Let's pray that God would lead them, guide them. Because I want to tell you, every decision that they make affects us. Amen? So when we pray for them to be empowered, we're empowered too. But the reason we pray is because, thank God, we've got a job. Amen? And we believe that God will lead our bosses. And if you're the boss, (laughs) put yourself under authority. Make sure that you submit to somebody because that's where our authority comes from. So maybe they are, are non, non-staff board members or, or trustees, and then pray for them. And then, family, the next one, authority that God has given us is family authority. And that would be, in our households, obviously be our parents, okay? And then also, there will be, um, it'll be in our husbands in, in our homes. I mean, family, very, very important that we submit. And once again, young people, I'm saying, honor your parents, And let me tell you, I know it's not always easy, and you may not like it, but the Bible tells us that we need to honor them. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment, so I'm going to leave that with you for a moment. And then the last authority that we have that God has given us is the most important of all, and that is our spiritual authority. I'm going to read to you, and these would be the people in the church that look after you so well, our dream teamers, our, our group leaders. Let me read to you 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. It says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So I'm speaking about our pastors, that when you maybe have lost a loved one, that are there for you, that help you, that do the funeral service, or maybe when you want to get married, that walk you through all those foundations and make sure you have a very firm foundation to build your marriage on and do the services for you. And then I want to today really also just speak about our children's church ministers. Family, sometimes we forget about them. They are giving their own time and effort to to give the word of God to our children and to pray for them and to hold our crying babies so that we can have time in the word. Let's show honor to them. Let's show appreciation to them. They don't have to do it. They do it because they love you and they love God. You know, even our cop, in fact, can I just say, can we just do a shout out to all of our dream teamers right now? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And if you are not on the car part of the car part, you're not in a dream team, let me say, today we have got growth track step one. Do the growth track. Become team ready. Join a team. Use your gifts and talents to the glory of our God. I want to go back now again to who it is that we honor. Number three we honor number now is that we honor parents. And I said I'm coming back to that. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and verse 1 that children should obey their parents. But now we're not children anymore, right? But in verse 2 it says this. It says, honor your father and your mother. And sometimes when we get older that becomes even more difficult. <laughs> But family, the Bible's very clear. It says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that you may, it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Now, if I may, in the, the words of my grandson, nine years old, he says to me, back in the day, Nana, BC, before COVID, <laughs> in the words of my grandson, back in the day when I was a little girl, that's what we did. I mean, you, let me say, you honored your parents. You were taught to do it. There was no other way. You did that. And I, I'm so thankful to God. Thankful to my God for the, the stable home that I grew up into. S- thankful to God for the fact that I had parents that were there for me. And family, I can tell you right now, because of that, 
I have seen God's favor in my life, undeserved favor. And I believe it was because of the way we honored our parents. And I've taught my children to do the same thing, and I've seen the favor of God on their lives. And number four that I want to talk about, who is it or what is it that we, we honor in this case, is we honor one of my favorite subjects, marriage. And I'm telling you, I break my heart when I see the disrespect that there is towards godly marriages in this day and age. I'm saying, family, you know what? I mean, even people that, that Christians that stand before God and say, till death us to part, and the first challenge that comes their way, they run away. And, and listen, I don't know your story, and I'm not getting on anyone's case this morning. I'm just saying, can we, as a church, as a Christian community, fight harder for marriage? Fight harder for this amazing institution that God the Father himself created, whereby he takes, yes, give God some praise, come on. Whereby God himself joins a man to a woman and makes them to become one flesh in this wonderful covenant of which he is the center. Amen, family? And here's another thing, you know, back in the day, <laughs> we used to call it a church wedding, right? I'm just going to throw that out there. When we say our vows, let's make sure that we're in a place where we're really standing before the altar of God. In the, well, you know, in actually the Marriage Act of South Africa, it only gives you three other options other than a church. The, other, the one is home affairs office. Who wants that, right? The other one is a home, a domestic home. And the last one in situations where it's pretty dire would be in a church, okay, in, a, in, a, in a hospital. So we don't want to do that. Let's make a decision. And I don't have a problem with wedding venues, but let's make sure there's a chapel that we can solemnize our, our marriage according to the Marriage Act, which is what is required. Really important that we, we stand before God and say this is a holy institution which he created. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It says, marriage should be honored. Everybody say, by all. Family, marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral if I may, once again, young people, hold on to your virginity. That's what God wants. He wants you to stand pure as you enter into this amazing marriage covenant that he created. 1 Peter 3 verse 7 takes it even up another notch, and it says it's in the same way. You husbands, give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Now, I understand, you probably never understand your wife, but the Bible's very clear. The, the Bible does not give any husband the right to manipulate or domin, dominate or intimidate his wife. He's saying, give honor to her. In fact, the Bible says that she is, when you find a wife, you find a good thing, right? She is a blessing from God. Have a look at this carries on and says, she may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Now, you know, I can imagine God saying, you know what, I hear your prayers and I really want to bless you, but you are not allowing me to. And then guys walk around and they say, you know, God never answers my prayers. Hello. So let me throw something out there to all the husbands. At the end of the service, when you leave, walk around the car to the passenger side, unlock the door, open the door, pick your wife off the ground because she would have passed that. <laughs> Family, we are going to be people of honor. Amen. Number five, we honor the age. The Bible says the white-haired person. I've kind of disqualified myself. But anyway, <laughs> Leviticus chapter 19 verse 32 says, it says, Rise. Now, back in the day, I want to tell you when an older person walked in, we had to stand up and we would say, Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Would you like to sit down? Let me read this to you. Rise in the presence of the age, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. Amen, family. 
So we honor, especially those older than ourselves. In Job 12, verse 12, it says, is not wisdom found amongst the aged? Now you may say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna learn things that my parents never even knew. I'm far more clever than they are. I mean, they don't even know how to use a phone. Really? Let me tell you what they know about. They know about life experience. You cannot learn that any other way but by having life. It carries on over here. It says, does not long life bring understanding? So I want to encourage you, get in, a, get in a small group where there's a couple of old golden oldies and talk to them about life and those age-old things that we think are not important anymore that are so important in our lives. And golden oldies, let's not stick together. Come on, let's give out all that experience that we have learned through so many years. Amen, family? Number six, you're right, taking notes. <laughs> Honor nature, okay? So, you know, think about this. Everything that God has created, he values. So, I mean, we should value nature as well. Let's not just destroy stuff for the sake of destroying it. Let's not litter. You know, I know there are people... <laughs> I got that from you. <laughs> I mean, I know people go hunting, and I'm saying, you know what, if you're going to make biltong, fine. But let's not kill just for the sake of killing. We're going to let that little bird chirp. We're going to let it live, family. Okay? It, it says in Genesis 1 verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth and subdue it. It carries on and says, rule over. Rule over actually means to manage well. Right? The fish of the sea and, and, and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, I'm sure there's some living creatures that move on the ground that you don't like very much. Rats and mice are my thing. <laughs> but this is, you're supposed to manage it well, which means they don't belong in my house, they belong out there. See, that's how we do it. <laughs> and then the next one, number seven, most importantly, we honor God. That's what it's all about that we come and we honor God with our lives, family. You know, it, it's sad that for many people, God has become this kind of celestial Santa Claus. You know, God, I just don't want to go to hell. I want to go in heaven. And here's, here's my prayer list of things that I need from you today. And family, you know what? Even when we come to church, the main reason that we come together as a family is to honor our God. I mean, we are servants and ministers to our God. That's the most important thing. Let me say this, as you know, it's not even about do I want to get up in the morning and say, well, am I going to get something out of the worship? Am I going to get something out of the message? We come here to honor God. And when we do that, you will. You will have an amazing weekend in services because when we honor God, he pours out his presence over us. And it's about coming to God and say, this is the first day of the week and before I go to work and before I play and before I do anything, I'm going to honor you, my God. Amen, family. I want to tell you, it matters to God. Malachi 1 of verse 6, it says this, a son honors his father, a slave his master. And we just stop there and say, that's a given. That's not even debatable. Let me read it again. A son honors his father, a slave his master. And then it carries on and says, if I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. In chapter 2, he actually says, I'm offended because you are giving your best to other things. I mean, God is crying out to be honored. And I want to get on your case a little bit here. That's talking about physically making the effort to be in church. Give yourselves a hand that you're here. Yes. And you guys on live stream, we understand. If you're far away and if you've got comorbidities and you've got health issues, we understand. But if you're at home and to get up in the morning and say, should I go or shall I watch it later or shall I maybe just go to the mall first? Come on, family. Come on. We are here to let God know, I honor you first. You have first place in my life. Amen. Right, so those are the seven who's. We're now going to look at the three hows. And the first thing is, how do we honor 
simply by putting them first. I was at a, a Christian uh, uh, event the other day, and <laughs> they had this like buffet dinner. It was quite funny because everyone's saying, "No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. <laughs> so yeah, it's fun. But that's what God wants from us. He's watching, and He notices those sort of things. He watches when we put others first. And I'm saying, notice more than anything else when God looks at us and He says, "You're in church. You put me first in your week." We're going to honor him that way because we're putting him first. Have a look at Proverbs 3 and verse 9. You know this is one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. And let me just push pause once again and say, that's not just your money. I mean, it's everything. It's your time. It's your ideas. It's your gifts. It's your talents. It's putting God and honoring him with all of that. It carries on, it says, with the first fruits. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now, this is speaking, yes, about earnings, and it's speaking, yes, about tithing. And I want to say, family, 10% is 10% is 10%. It's the same for all of us. Now, you may look at it and think, oh, there's so much or so little or whatever. It's about the order where God is saying, Wow, you're honoring me before your house, before your car, before you buy food for your children. You're honoring me first. That's what he's saying. In the message translation, it says, honor the Lord with everything you own. Give him your first and your best. And then the second thing of how we honor, and this is something we all need to be reminded of regularly by our words. What is it that we are saying about people in front of them and behind their backs? Let me read to you James 3 verse 9 and 10. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Carries on, it says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And you may sit there and you think, yeah, but I don't like that person. Don't say it. Don't say it. I'm sure there are things God doesn't like about us. But he doesn't say it. He's never going to curse us. I mean, family, Ephesians 4 verse 29, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And it carries on, and it almost seems like he's talking about something different and it's separate, but it starts with, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Imagine that every single time that we say something negative about a person who's been made in the image of God, that the Holy Spirit is grieved, saying, God said that he sent his only son. You know what it says. Last one I'm going to end with this is that we honor by protecting them. You see, everything that we honor, we value, and those things that we value, we protect. I mean, if it's something that is great, worth a lot of money, we're going to protect that thing. If it's something that has great sentimental value, we're going to protect that thing. So I want to tell you a story right now. A lot of you may know a great baseball player that goes in the U.S. His name is Babe Ruth. How many of you have heard of Babe Ruth? Thank you. Does this look dangerous? Let me tell you the story about Babe Ruth. He was one of the greatest home, ritter, home run hitters, I'll get that right, of all time. He, they actually signed him up at such a young age, he wasn't able to sign, him, sign himself. His parents had to sign for him. And family, through his career, Babe Ruth signed many, many baseballs, but he only signed seven bats. And for many years, the sixth, seventh bat, they found the sixth, knew exactly where they were, but the seventh bat was nowhere to be found. They didn't know where it was. And years later... Actually, this guy had, had it, and in 1988, this guy was very, very ill. He had a nurse looking after him all the time, and he was on his deathbed. And he took the bat out, and he gave it to his nurse. Her name was, was um, what was her name again? Marsha. Gave it to her. She didn't have a clue 
what it was that she had, the seventh bath that they've been looking for for so long. So she took the bath and she put it under her bed and she left it there for 18 years. And in 2006, she pulled the bat out. And this is not that bat. <laughs> but what she did, she pulled it out. She took it to a memorabilia store. I mean, this guy nearly collapsed when he saw that this was the seventh bat. And she, they decided to auction it off. Guess what they got? 1.3 million rand for that bat. And you know, family, the bat itself was probably worth what this one is worth, about maybe $20 plus shipping. But because his name was on it, it was, the value just went right up. And so what she did, she opened, she wanted to, to open a little restaurant, and she went ahead and she opened the restaurant. She didn't use even a, a fraction of that money. And the rest of it she donated into this foundation for children that Babe Ruth loved so much. And she said these amazing words. She said, this, the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. And since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing that I could do was something that would honor his life. So the question is this, is why do we honor people? Because for me, God's name is written on them. You see, and when we allow Jesus into our lives, he writes his name even on our hearts. I'd really just like to pray for each and every person that's listening to us this morning. Can we just bow our heads for a moment? Father, I just want to thank you for this amazing congregation, Lord, and I speak the spirit of honor into our church, and I pray, Father God, that we are going to leave this place today changed. Father, I pray that everything we touch and everything that we do will bring honor and glory to your beautiful name. Father, help us to value people, Lord, to see them as you see them, Father, to value them the way you value them, Father. And I just pray for each and every single person that's here today, Father, who maybe doesn't feel that they have any value. Let them know that you matter to them, my God. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to ask you just to keep your eyes closed if you would. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.